let's talk a little bit about game theory. Sometimes in economics, people want to be able to describe situations that involve what we call strategic interaction. Strategic interaction just means that now not only does your payoff, your profit, your utility, however you want to think about it, depend on your own choices, but it also depends on the choices of other people in your market, in your industry, and so on and so forth. Typical examples of strategic interaction usually involve decisions among firms regarding whether to cooperate or to compete. We're going to go over an example that has a slightly different context, known as the prisoner's dilemma, where people are deciding whether or not to confess to a particular crime. The setup of the prisoner's dilemma is a tad bit contrived, but it goes as follows. Imagine a situation in which two people are brought in for supposedly committing a crime. Now these two people are held in separate cells, so they can't talk to each other. And even if they could, they couldn't somehow contract on whether or not they were going to confess to the crime. The people are then brought in individually and, say, and asked, do you confess or do you not confess? We can represent the payoffs to that sort of situation in a table as follows. You'll notice here that we have player one and player two. I made things nicely color-coded such that we have player one's payoffs in terms of utility in blue to match player one, and player two's payoffs in terms of utility in green here. So you'll notice that if neither player confesses, they just sit there and hold tight, they each get a payoff of 10. If the first guy keeps quiet and then the second guy rats him out, the second guy gets 15 while the first player gets nothing. The opposite happens here. If the first player rats out the second one, now the first player gets 15, and the second player gets nothing. And if they both try to rat each other out, they both end up with 5. Meaning, they're better off than if they just sat here and had the other guy rat them out, but not quite as well off collectively as if they both kept quiet. The question then becomes, given this structure, what's going to happen? In reality, both players are making the decision of whether or not to confess at the same time, but let's just pretend that they can guess or somehow know what the other person is going to do, and we can ask a number of hypothetical questions as to what the best responses for these players would be. So let's take the first case here. Say, if player one confesses, what should player two do? In other words, what's player two's best response? Well, we can go over here. We say, if player one confesses, we're somewhere in the bottom here, and player two can either get zero by holding out and being quiet, or he can get five by confessing also. Five is strictly better than zero, so if player one confesses, player two also wants to confess. Now what about if player one doesn't confess? Well, if player one doesn't confess, we're up here. Say, so, well, player two again has two options. He can get 10 by keeping quiet, or he can get 15 by routing out his buddy. So 15 is better than 10. So if player one doesn't confess, player two still should confess. Notice here that it's interesting that player two, his best option is to confess regardless of what player one does. Or alternatively put, player two's best option is to confess regardless of what he thinks player one is going to do. This type of situation is called a dominant strategy in that confess is a dominant strategy for player two, meaning it's always the best regardless of what the other guy does. Think about this the other way around. Say we make some guesses as to what player two is going to do, and then we say in each case what's player one's best response in that situation. So if player two confesses, what's the best thing for player one to do? So if player two confesses, we're over here on the right somewhere. We say player one can either get five by confessing, 
or zero for being quiet, this problem is looking strangely familiar, so well five is better than zero, so player one is going to want to confess. Now if player two doesn't confess, what should player one do? So if player two doesn't confess, we're over here on the left somewhere, and player one can either get ten by being quiet, or fifteen by writing out his buddy. Well, fifteen is greater than ten, so he's going to want to confess. Notice here that because we got confess in both cases, confessing is also a dominant strategy for player one. So here I've circled player two's best responses in green, and I've circled player one's best responses in blue. And you'll notice that there's one place here where they overlap to say that in the situation where both parties confess, both of them are responding as best they can to what they think the other person is going to be doing. We say that this situation here is what's called a Nash equilibrium. More formally put, a Nash equilibrium is a situation where each player's action is the best response to the other player's actions. In a situation where the players are all moving simultaneously, this basically means that each player is reacting best to what they think the other person is going to do, and they're actually right in their guess of what the other person is going to do. Notice here that the equilibrium outcome actually it doesn't look as good as it could because here we're saying that in equilibrium when people are acting according to their own best interests each of them ends up with a payout of 5 whereas if they only cooperated they would each get a payout of 10. We can say here that there could be a Pareto improvement going from both parties confessing to both parties staying quiet in that both parties would be made better off and nobody would be made worse off. Unfortunately, due to the competitive nature of this game, that's not what's going to result because it's really hard when there's no contracting involved to guarantee, regardless of what the other party says, that when it comes down to it, they're actually going to cooperate, given that it's in their best interests individually to not cooperate. So one question that economists like to think about is then, how can cooperation be sustained in the real world? Well, one thing that's important to remember here is that in the real world, this game isn't played just once. When you have firms interacting with each other, people making these decisions, oftentimes they have the chance to make the decisions over and over and over. So when you have what's called a repeated game, you might have a situation where people start testing out the waters to say, well, maybe if I cooperate, the other guy's going to cooperate and then we can keep this going. Because to cooperate here and hope for the best outweighs, you know, there's this threat of, well, if you try to screw me one time, we're reverting back here, actually gives in the long term an incentive to cooperate. So like I said, it seems a little bit artificial to be talking about this context of prisoners being interrogated, because really we're talking about economics. But it's very easy to see how this situation could be relevant in an economic context by just replacing the intuition behind some of the choices. So what I did here is set up the identical game and have this modeled as still player one and player two, but now they have the choice of whether or not to cooperate or to compete. And you can see here, they both do better off by cooperating, but they also all have the private incentive to compete. And you can notice here that this situation is actually pretty realistic because at least in the United States, firms are not allowed to contract on whether or not they're going to cooperate. That's called collusion. It's illegal. So they really are simultaneously making independent choices as, about, as to how much to cooperate with their quote-unquote competitors.